Dan, in a previous interview, we talked about the what uh, energy transitions look like over time, like a twenty over twenty five years, over fifty. How in the moment the data is very bumpy. It's very disorganized and messy, and it can look, you know, depending on what happens year by year, you can think maybe there's a transition, maybe they're not. But when you pull back thirty five thousand feet and you look at it from above, the 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 trends, the processes become much more apparent. And I think we're far enough into this transition that we can do that. Would you agree? I agree. I think we've we've kind of hit that level of materiality now on Electrotech where we, it becomes sort of, it, it's, well, it's big enough uh, to that we can no longer ignore that there's something significant happening here. Uh, but it's also becoming big enough to actually for us to talk about, you know, uh, starting to fit S-curves through things. You can't really do that when things are 1% or 2% of the total system because who knows where this is going. But at some point, you kind of can start seeing this curve trend upwards. And, and uh, now I think we we're now in a moment. It's quite exciting over the past four or five years that we have enough data that we can actually start doing some proper sort of trend forecasting on what's happening in the system. Um, and it's hard, right? Forecasting is always hard, and it's always very easy to get caught up in the in the momentary zeitgeist that that seems in energy to change every six months between we're all going to die and uh, everything is going very smoothly. Um, and so um, it's very hard to do that. So what you need to do, at least what we do, is um, our motto is is, key, uh, is always if you want to look thirty years into the future, you need to look at least thirty years into the past uh, to understand what's happening because those are the kind of time scales the you know, the through cycle view. Um, and when you look at the through cycle view of Electrotech, it's just been a story of up and up and up so far. And there's a very good reason uh, the, uh, from the theory point of view of why we would look into the past. And, you know, uh, I mentioned all the time that, you know, we have an, er an energy transition theory of change. It's built on the idea that clean energy technology has progressed over the last 30 to 50 years, hit its inflection point roughly around 2020, and is now on the hockey stick uh, 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 you know, growth curve where it will it's now displacing uh, the old technology in the marketplace. So what you're looking for when you say what you want to look into the past, what you're really looking for when, with respect to Electrotech is when did it get introduced to the market? How has it developed over time to the point where, and this is all at the bottom of the S-curve, this process takes place. How did it uh, progress to the point where it then hit the inflection point. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that China took technology that was developed in the West, largely the US, and scaled it up and commercialized it. And that's the last 10, 15 years of that 30 year looking back at, and the reason why we did hit the inflection point with Electrotech. Yeah, look, when you're, when you're forecasting, you're always looking for leading indicators, something that can tell you something about the future before anyone else can see it. And so, I mean, the, the silly way to look at the energy system today is just look at the stock of like what is, what is currently the installed system. And there, indeed, you get that sort of typical fossil beam of most primary energy still comes from fossil fuels. And it has changed by a few percentage, uh, percentage points uh, in terms of share from fossil fuels since, uh, you know, since uh, 20 years ago. That is sort of like the stock view. Of course, that's uh, that's not the, the way to understand where the stock is going because just looking at what it is today doesn't tell you about where, the, where it's heading. So you need to look at the flow of what actually comes into the system every year, how much is installed every year, how much is invested every year. There already we see it becoming interesting because we see you know two thirds of energy investment today going into electrotech and only one third still going into fossil tech. I mean, total investments, for instance, solar are now bigger than upstream oil investments, right? So this is really showing that something is shifting. So yes, maybe at the stock level, it's still mostly oil, but at the inflow level, now it's mostly electrotech. And then we can go one step further and say like, what drives flow? That's largely economics. And so that's, a, that's one step where you can go further up the chain. You say like, okay, now let's look at prices. Let's look at how batteries are getting cheaper, how solar panels are getting cheaper, how EVs are, can now compete on sticker price in many markets with ICE cars. And that's another leading in indicator because you know if these things become economically cheaper, at some point investors are going to catch on and pour a lot of money into that. And then, you know, you could say there's been a step before that, which is what leads to these price decreases, which is innovation and R&D. And so you can take these leading indicators of booming patents and booming R&D investments by these large companies to see that as quite likely these R&D spending is going to result in cost innovations. And that will trickle all the way down to prices, then to flows and then to stocks. And that's what we try to do in our 30-year perspectives is we try to go 
find as many leading indicators upstream to from that predict where we could be in 20 to 30 years. And, and as, as every forecaster, we will be wrong as well in our own unique way. Uh, but I find this often a much more clear cut way to look at the predictions of the future rather than to come up with, you know, a model that has a fixed price forecast or a fixed outlook or some fixed constraints in there. Let me uh, relate an, a, an anecdote that I think backs up your point. So about a month, six weeks ago, I interviewed a fellow named Jorge Varga. He's the CEO of Aspen Power in the United States. And we were, and his company is into renewables in a big way. I think they've got 600 renewables projects on the go. They do a lot of uh, integration with big industry and, and, and big businesses. And and <clears throat> so we were talking about the, the uh, impact that Donald Trump will have on the adoption of Electrotech you know, uh, and the, you know, rolling back the Inflation Reduction Act and so on. And he made a really interesting point, Dan. He said, at the utility scale, that's absolutely true. That, you know, that will, uh, those, uh, ending those tax credits will slow down the adoption of solar at utility scale. But he said, the kind of work that we do, which is where we go into like an industry, a plant, uh, something, industrial park, something like that, and we take solar, solar panels, we take batteries, and we take digital controls, all made in China, or even made in the United States, which is significantly more expensive than the Chinese technology. And he said, we integrate and make a system for that company so that they have, they're self-generating and they can be off the grid, you know, if the grid goes down or it has brownouts, whatever, becomes unstable, then they're protected. He said, that's the booming business and it's driven by economics because we are now the cheap, cheapest way to generate electricity. And we provide insurance for these companies. We save them money at the same time. And that to me is the electrotech uh, is on the ground has now become the most competitive option. And so you can expect to see that, you know, the fossil generation over time, even in a market, where the federal government is hostile to that technology, the technology will find a way, it's like water, it will flow to the lowest point because it's the best, lowest cost, highest value alternative. And this is, I think, the origin of the bumpiness also that we're seeing uh, uh, right now, right? So when we see this bumpiness of electrotech uptake from one year to, to the next, I think it's because we're encountering bottlenecks and it's, it's almost like, you know, water indeed flowing down uh, down a down a, a mountain and encountering a dam and then for for a certain amount of time you know water builds up it doesn't flow further down river but it either finds a way around the dam via another route or at some point it breaks down the dam and the water continues flowing and I think th this is for me the the best metaphor to think about what's happening with electrotech it's getting cheaper and cheaper and yes it's possible in the U.S. to now build a very strong dam to hold up the tides of change right this river of change that is coming but it will find different ways. And if, if you're going to make it very hard at the utility level to build out these cheaper energy sources, there's going to be another flow somewhere around it on the mountain that is uh, distributed energy resources, for instance, right? The, 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 the DER uh, uh, revolution that we're seeing happening, this, this idea of permissionless DER that we're seeing, right? Just buying a solar panel and plugging it in. You don't need permission. You just get you know, balcony solar or behind the meter battery very easily. I think this is a, a, a big movement that I think we're under uh, underestimating um, in, in the US. And it's another you know, case in point of uh, when something is just cheaper, people will find a way to implement it. And then you can hold up the tides of change, but at some point either the dam will break or the river will find a way around the dam. And I think that's, that's what we're waiting for in the US right now. It's just now that we have built up new dams in, in different ways, very quickly different than, uh, than uh, in the previous administration, uh, how will the water reflow and reroute itself? And, and I think we're still seeing that settle in at the moment. Uh, that's interesting because I've done some interviews on that very topic. And one of the, uh, you know, everybody understands now that the uh, addition of uh, data centers and AI and electrification uh, is now going to be increasing the uh, U.S. Uh, electricity uh, demand growth 3 to 5% a year, which is enormous in a system like that that's used to zero growth or maybe 1%. Now you're going to have 3 to 5%. And... The problem here is that the utilities have been caught flat-footed. They can't do 
Nobody wants to do coal anymore. They want to shut down coal because their plants are old. They can't build hydro quickly. They can't build nukes quickly. Uh, they can't build natural gas, even though they got tons of, of cheap gas. They can't build it because there's a five to six year wait for combined cycle turbines, on and on and on. The only technology that's available for rapid deployment and is, is affordable, even at when it's manufactured inside the United States, is wind, solar, and batteries. And so the, uh, the, the dam uh, is that, you know, they're, they can't get all of these other ge uh, power generation technologies. They have uh, high demand, accelerating demand growth. They have to do something. They can't do nothing. That nothing is not an option. And I interviewed uh, Ed Hurst, an energy economist at the University of Houston. And I said, well, who's going to pay the, the higher prices? Isn't that? He's just said, well, consumers will. You know, they'll, they'll just pass the price on to consumers and that'll be the cost of doing business and that's the way it's going to be. And you see exactly that very thing beginning to play out in the United States. Yes, and I think it's good to note here, by the way, is that, I mean, I mean, we also see it in Europe all over, right? It's indeed this idea of like, oh, load growth is back. How scary, right? Uh, it's it's uh, such a rapid speed up that we need to go through. Um, again, it, it helps here to not look at the bumpy year to year metrics, but to look at the 30, 40, 50 year perspective here, because pre 2008, both in Europe and the US, demand used to grow. I mean, from the 50s to the 70s, demand grew by almost 7 percent per year, both in Europe and the United States. Then from the 90s to 2008, it was more than 2 percent per year growth across the board. Um, then since 2008, actually, since the financial crash, it's quite shocking. You actually see that demand growth. Uh, leveled off actually uh, electrification as well like the share of energy that we get from electricity also flattened off it stopped increasing uh, and now we're talking about a scenario where we're seeing again rapid electrification take place but at rapid electrification what kind of growth percentages are we talking about if you combine data centers with heat pumps with all the other stuff it is roughly 1.8 percent in europe and maybe two percent 2.1 percent in the united states these are growth rates that we were sporting every year from the 90s to 2008. This is not something that is unprecedented. We have better technologies today for grids, better technologies for integration, more of a purpose and a direction of where this is heading than it was from the 90s to, the, to, the, to 2008. But somehow it would be very different and much more challenging today. And I think this is the part where, where I have some disbelief in how hard this actually is. We've done it before. What we need to do is we need to sort of find back our pre-2008 selves in the West uh, and just get going, uh, replicate what we did before um, and get moving. I'll, I'll wrap up this interview with a, an anecdote, Dan, from British Columbia, the province that I live in, which has uh, you know, like 98% of its power comes from, from hydro. Uh, and they had exactly that pre-2008, 2% annual growth. And the utility here, which is government owned, BC Hydro, was projecting that well beyond 2008. And they actually built up surplus power uh, generation because, you know, after 2008, everything was flat. Why was it flat? This is the, the key question. Why was it flat? Because in BC, which is very much a natural resource economy, it had pulp and paper mills, it had sawmills, big sawmills. They closed down. Many of them closed down. Those were enormous loads on the provincial uh, power grid. And when they closed down, that demand went away. And so that combined with some of the things that the utility did, like energy efficiency programs and so on, to make better use of what we what was generating, essentially demand has stayed flat up until just recently. But now with electric, uh, electrification and, and LNG plants that are gonna be electrified and so on, now we're seeing they're planning for two to 3% growth again. and. And this, uh, you know, that I think that is a concrete example of why things are changing, how things are changing, and utilities are beginning to plan for it, either because they're being told to if the government owns them, uh, or they're, they're corporations. They see this as a money-making opportunity. This, this is what we see as a big problem. They see as, hey, we're going to sell more of the stuff we, we produce. What a great deal.
every bottleneck is a billion dollar or a trillion dollar opportunity right now. I think uh, it's uh, it's uh, I, I agree with you. It's it's uh, it's almost like a, a inherent climate view to look at every bottleneck as a as an inherent problem. Um, it's actually also quite exciting. I mean, I was at this large DER conference last week here in the US, Dervos. And I mean, these people only get excited when they see bottlenecks because they go, great, that's another billion dollar opportunity that I can add to my business, right? There's a lot of money to be made in bottlenecks. And so for, from an economic point of view, especially for countries in the West that have a lot of technical know-how and software know-how and this kind of stuff, the fact that it's kind of hard to integrate renewables sort of logistically wise, it's kind of expensive to uh, uh, currently upgrade the grid. These are really exciting opportunities to make a lot of money on. Uh, we're now facing those problems at home. We know that the rest of the world will be facing them very soon, especially as the Global South is racing up that S-curve right now. They'll be running into those problems soon enough. And if we have the solutions, we can sell billions of dollars of product, uh, uh, products into the world. Uh, so I'm I very much in agreement. Um, uh, bottlenecks are also actually, in a way, exciting. And so this bumping is every time we, we go over one of those speed bumps and, and you get like, you know, German car sales bumping or EV infrastructure not being rolled out fast enough, this kind of stuff. Um, it is a challenge if you look at this through a carbon lens or, or a detriment if you look through a carbon lens. But if you think about this through an opportunity lens, it's apparently something that we can learn here, apparently something that we can uh, uh, learn and then export to the rest of the world. And as you made the point earlier, that investment in electrotech and renewables is now uh, uh, two times that of the investment in the oil and gas industry. And, it, and it's that flow into a different stock of, of technology. And that has to build up over time and it's building up very rapidly. Dan, this has been another fascinating conversation. Thank you very much for this. Thank you, Markham.